December 1942, January 1943, embarkation leave. As the monkey keeper at the zoo said, when a newly trussed up gorilla arrived, it was bound to come. We were going overseas. Of course, we should have gone yesterday. Everything had to be packed into everything else yesterday. Some uh, great wooden crates appeared yesterday. Good God, said Edgington yesterday, they're sending us all by parcel post. The crates were filled, nailed down and stenciled this way up at all angles. Vehicles had to be waterproofed. Oh, dearie me, this smacked of a beach landing. Everything was camouflaged black and dark green, so it couldn't be the desert. All our missing clothing was replaced. We then ran straight down to the town and sold them. One issue was a large vacuum-sealed tin of emergency chocolate, only to be eaten in the event of, say, being surrounded by the enemy. That night, in bed, surrounded by the enemy, I ate my emergency chocolate. The news had been broken by the old man in the naffy hut, the dear old naffy hut. In it we wrote letters home, drank tea, played ping-pong, bang tunes out on the piano, or, when we had no money, just sat there to keep warm. It was in this hut that I first heard the voice of Churchill on the old brown Bakelite echo radio. On the day of the official pronouncement, we were marched in and sat down. Enter Major Chatterjack. Ice front! Chatterjack acknowledges battery. Sergeant Major salutes. At ease, Sergeant Major. At ease it is. You can all smoke, said Chatterjack. I'm going to. Light laughter. Smilingly, he started to speak. You may have been hearing rumours that we were going abroad. Laughter. Rumours had been non-stop. We are finally going overseas. It's what we've all been trained for, so it shouldn't come as a shock. He cut out all the unnecessary gas, told us dates and times. A very Scots voice in the mic said, Where are we going, sir? Well, I know it's not Glasgow. Roars of laughter. Embarkation leave will start immediately. Married men first. They need it. Laughter. A voice from the back, don't we all? Loud laughter. He told us that there would be a farewell dinner dance at the Devonshire Arms. He finished with good luck to you all. It was a time of incredible excitement. God knows how we got so much done in so short a time. Men usually only have one active participation in a war during their lifetime. It was about to happen to us. We had problems. For instance, the double base we had knocked off from the Delaware Pavilion. I haven't mentioned this before because I've been waiting for the original owner to die. It was stolen in anticipation of Alf Files learning to play it. It had been noticed that the base had been lying in the corner of a backstage room. We measured the size, passed the measurements on to Bombardier Donaldson, who had a crate made to fit. The outside of the crate was stencil Mark III Beaufort gun spares. One morning after parade, we drove to the pavilion and hurried in through the back door with the crate. A few moments later, we hurried out with it. Nothing had changed, save the weight had increased by one double base. It was rushed out to our workshops, where high-speed work was done in stripping the varnish off, staining the wood a deep black oak, then re-varnishing. It was whilst in the middle of the last mentioned operation that we got our overseas sailing orders, so, not wanting to lose the fruits of our labours, we decided to give the base to Harry Eddington to take home for his brother Doug, who was desperate to learn to play the instrument. Somewhere in the dark of a December evening, Harry smuggled the base aboard a London-bound train and put it down at his home in St John's Road, Archway. While we were overseas, we had a letter saying that Doug had won first prize for the best bass pair in London, and had won a Melody Maker medal. Who said crime doesn't pay? Our leaves overlapped. I went straight home to Rissaline Road, Broccoli Rise, where my family had returned when my father was posted back to London. I arrived at Victoria Station during the rush hour. The crowd were a weird mixture of grey faces carrying early Christmas shopping. I was wearing my new red artillery forage cap and felt rather conspicuous. I took the crowded tube to London Bridge and then from there a train to Honor Oak Park. The faces of the commuters were tired and pinched. A gazely one would steal a look at me. I don't know why. To break the boredom, I suppose. A man of about fifty in a dark suit and overcoat leaned over and said, Would you like a cigarette? Thank you, I said, and like a bloody fool smoked it. A bloody fool because, dear reader, I had just gone through three weeks' agony having given up the habit. As I walked from the station down Rizzoli Road, a raid was in progress. It was very, very dark, and I had to peer closely at several doors before I arrived at number 50. The family were about to have dinner in the Anderson shelter. Ah, son, said my father, that wonderful welcoming voice he had. You're just in time for the main course. 
Holding a torch, he showed me down the garden. Put that bloody light out, said my brother in a mock ARP warden voice. The voice was in the process of breaking, and I swear in speaking that short sentence he went from middle C to A above the stave. By the light of a hurricane lamp called Storm Saviour Brand, I squeezed next to my mother. They had made the shelter as comfortable as possible, with duck boards and a carpet on top, an oil heater, books, and a battery radio. Mother said grace, and the four of us started eating lukewarm powdered egg, dehydrated potatoes, least len carrots, and wartime strength tea. I felt awful. So far I hadn't suffered anything. Seeing the family in these miserable circumstances did raise a lump in my throat. But they, they seemed cheery enough. Got a surprise for you, son, said father, putting his hand under the table and produced a bottle of Chateau Latour 1934. It's shelter temperature, he said. We drank a toast to the future. The next time the family would drink a toast together would be ten years later. Mother related how the week previously the whole family had nearly been killed. It was nine at night. Father, wearing aught but Marks and Spencer's utility long underwear and tartan slippers, was heavily poised in the kitchen making a cup of tea, strength three. He was awaiting that jet of steam from the kettle that signals the invention of the steam engine. In the lounge, oblivious of the drama in the kitchen, were my mother and brother. This bedroom had been modified into a bedroom come sitting room, double bed in one corner, and a single for my brother in the other. This arrangement made my brother's night manipulations extremely difficult. However, mother was seated on an elephantine imitation brown moquette couch with eased springs, knitting balaclavas for the lads at the front. My brother Desmond, a lad of fourteen, was sitting on his bed looking through his wartime scrapbook, reading out aloud sections on Hitler's promised invasion. A two-thirds slag, one-third coal fire smoked merrily in the grate. Suddenly, a colossal explosion, a range Luftwaffe. Mother was blown six feet up in the sitting position, then backwards over the couch. My brother was shot up against the wall, reaching ceiling level before returning. The fire was sucked up the chimney, as were my mother's CNA mode slippers. The cheeseman of Lewisham's imitation velour curtains billowed in, and the room was filled with ash. It was all over in a flash. My mother was upside down behind the couch. My father appeared at the door. What's happening, he said. He presented a strange figure, clutching a steaming kettle, and smoke blackened from head to foot with soot. He said, wait here. He went to the back door and shouted, anybody there? He then returned and said, it's all right, he's gone. Despite the activities of German bombers, I was determined to sleep in my old bed. Sheets, sheer bliss. Lying in bed, I realized that the family was finally broken up. The war had made inroads on our peacetime relationship. I was independent. My brother no longer had my company. All was changed. For the better, we'll never know. We had been a, a very close-knit family, something not many British families were. The new cross pallid dance was still open. Next night, I took Lily Chandler, a girl in whom I had a 51% controlling interest, to the palais. It was a long room with a gallery running around the top. Chicken wire had been stretched below the gallery because of the habit of people throwing things down on the dancers. A five-piece band were blowing its way through the wartime standard tunes. The room was packed with civvies, soldiers, sailors and airmen. With the windows closed and blackouts, the atmosphere was stifling. I spent the evening waltzing, foxtrotting and chatting up Miss Chandler. I still see the bobbing heads of the dancers and the reflected spots from the revolving glass ball above me. Every dance in those days ended with the waltz, Who's taking you home tonight? And everyone would sing it sotto voce as they glided around. While I was doing this, the last bloody tram was leaving. So I had to walk, Mrs. Chandler, back to 45 Revlon Road, Broccoli, a matter of two miles. The raid was still on. We walked back through deserted streets. Occasional fragments of ak, -ak shells would whoosh down and spat on the pavement. They do say, if you were hit by one of our own ak, -ak fragments, you could have your rates reduced. Lily was wearing black. I think she had a premonition about me. As we approached Malpass Road, a stick of three bombs fell about half a mile to our left, but they passed directly overhead and Lily and I lay down against the wall. While we were down there, I tried to make love to her. Don't be a fool, she said. That was close, she remarked. I'm not sure whether she referred to the bombs or me. I spent some half an hour kissing her good night in the doorway and tried everything, but she kept saying, Stop it! Or don't come the old assing with me. So I walked another two miles back to my house, bent double with pain and sexual frustration. 
My week's leave was spent in sitting in with local gig bands, seeing people from Woolwich Arsenal, where I'd worked before the war, drinking and walking home bent double with sexual frustration from 45 Revlon Road, Broccoli. I arrived back off leave, and I quote from my diary, returned back at billets to find everybody drunk, jolly, or partially out of their minds. The knowledge that at last we were going overseas had given the battery the libertine air of the last days at school. It was impossible to try and sleep. Everyone was hell-bent on playing practical jokes. Beds crashed down in the night, buckets of water were fixed over doors, boots were nailed to the floor, there were yells and screams as thunder flashes exploded under the unsuspecting victim's bed. The battery was in a state of flux. Most were on leave, others were about to go, others were on their way back, some couldn't get back, others didn't want to. One night the barracks were full, the next night they were empty. God knows who was running us, certainly all the officers were on leave. What one good fifth columnist could have wrought at that time doesn't bear thinking about. I remember very well one rainy night, Harry and I lay in bed, talking, smoking, unable to sleep with excitement. Let's go and have a jam in the naffy, he said. It seemed a good idea. It was about one in the morning when we got in. For an hour we played These Foolish Things, Room 504, Serenade in Blue, Falling Leaves, and the Inevitable Blues. In retrospect, it wasn't a happy occasion. Two young men, away from home, playing sentimental tunes in a pitch-black dark naffy. Oh, yesterday, leave me alone. Friday, December the 18th, 1942. The place? The Devonshire Arms. The occasion? The farewell dinner and dance for D Battery. It was Chater Jack's idea, and I think I'm right in saying that he paid for the whole evening himself, because I overheard Captain Martin saying to him, you'll pay for this. For the first time, D Battery Band didn't play. The music was provided by Jack Shaw and his band. We would have liked to have played, but Chater Jack insisted that we had the night off for once. It was a marvellous evening. We all enjoyed the dinner despite the frugal wartime fare. The enthusiasm of the occasion was terrific. In retrospect, I don't suppose many of the lads had ever been to a dinner dance on this scale. It was the eve of what, for most of us, was the greatest adventure of our lives. The moment the speeches arrived, and BSM Poole rapped on the table with a knife handle. Order, please, for the battery commander, Major Chatterjack, MC, DSO. We gave the old man a wild round of clapping, infiltrated with Cockney witticism. Good old Chater, hold on, I haven't finished me duff yet. The Major was in great form. He had already been in one war, so he knew what it was all about. Taking a swig at his favourite whisky, he wiped his mouth with a napkin and said, Fellow gunners, this got a spontaneous cheer, we're going to war. It's not much to worry about. At this spot he got groans. At least not this evening. He went on through a fairly predictable speech, war being long periods of boredom, broken by moments of great excitement. During moments of boredom, our Lord a certain amount of blankoing. Here he got great groans and cries of not again. With a gleam in his eye, he went on. Ah, but during moments of intense excitement, I will order a double issue of rum ration. Now a toast. The king. We all stood and drank and mumbled the king. Next we had the guest speaker. Silence, please, for Captain Arrowsmith, RHQ. Captain Arrowsmith rose. He was a tough man. In many ways, he reminded me of Colonel Custer, in that he was a glory seeker. He was a brave man and was killed in action in Italy. Gentlemen, he commenced, the Royal Regiment have an appointment for the Bosch, and as you know, the Royal Regiment always keeps its appointments. This sort of rhetoric got the gunners all patriotic, and he got a storm of applause. He made us all feel important. He ended his speech with the toast, Gentlemen, the regiment. The regiment, we echoed. What bloody regiment, said a drunken voice. The dinner over, the dance got underway. Some lads had brought their wives down for the occasion. The local mistresses and girlfriends were all present. Everyone knew everyone. I picked up a WAF corporal. Her name was Betty. I forget the surname. I ended up in bed with her somewhere in Cooden Drive. I always remember a woman looking round the door and saying, Have you got enough blankets? And I replied something like, How dare you enter the king's bedchamber when he's discussing foreign policy? This sudden late affair with Betty flowered rapidly, and we did a lot of it in the last dying days prior to embarkation. Actually, I was glad when we left. I couldn't have kept up this non-stop soldiering all day and lover all night with only cups of tea in between. I was having giddy spells, even laying down. I don't suppose there's anything more exciting than a sudden affair. It is the sort of thing that defeats the weather and gives you a chance to air your battle dress. When I went overseas, Betty wrote me sizzling letters that I auctioned to the battery lectures.